Hi there. In this video, we continue with the Queen's Gambit accepted. In the previous one, we discussed uh, all the major possibilities of white except for knight to f3. And our main focus this time is exactly this knight to f3 move. So after d4, d5, c4, d takes c4, uh, knight goes to f3. Uh, the main idea is to control e5 square. So in the previous video, we have seen that in many cases, black can counterattack with the e7, e5, and the knight f3 move is designed exactly to prevent it. So white delays the occupation of the center uh, for just a bit, uh, mainly focusing on the development and controlling the central square e5, additionally supporting d4, and will attack c4 a bit later. So black has several options here. Let's start with the straightforward b5, very greedy continuation, uh, just uh, to save the pawn on c4 to keep it. Uh, as usual, it's not so good because white may undermine the pawn immediately. Uh, again, a6 doesn't work because the rook is hanging, so c6 is more or less forced here if black wants to keep the pawn on b5 protecting c4. And white can continue with the attack against these pawns b5 and c4. So first, white plays e3, a modest move, uh, preparing the development of the light squared bishop and already exerting some pressure on c4. Let's say black continues with the e6, just to show you the idea. Uh, a takes b5 now, c takes b5, what else? And white may start the attack against these pawns with b3. So the problem is, uh, if uh, black captures on b3, there is b5 hanging. Uh, if not, then white can take on c4, uh, getting some initiative and uh, advantage in the center. So another option for black is to start with the a6 in that position, uh, trying to protect the pawn in advance. So exactly in this situation, what if black starts with a6? Looks logical because after e3, black's b5 move and uh, white's a4 undermining the b5 pawn. Finally, it's possible not to play c6 and continue with the bishop to b7, protecting the rook on a8, so that at first glance a takes b5 doesn't give white anything. So in this case, white continues with the same uh, b3, undermining the uh, black's uh, a6, b5, c4 brigade, and after something like e6, b takes c4. Uh, well, there are different options, of course, but after the most natural, b takes c4, bishop takes c4, and the development of other pieces, let's say knight to f6 and castling. We may notice that black's pawn structure uh, on the queen side uh, is quite bad. Uh, mainly because of the C pawn, which is now abandoned uh, by other pawns from adjacent files. Uh, there are no pawns in adjacent files. The only uh, natural way for black to get rid of this weakness is probably to play C5, but it's clear that after something like bishop to A3, uh, white is having the uh, initiative and some sort of advantage because white is much better developed. C5 is under pressure. It's not really pleasant to take on D4 because after bishop takes F8, there will be no castling anymore. So uh, black is having some problems here. White is exerting some uh, really nasty pressure. So for black, it's better, again, not to play greedy moves. So black should rather forget about c4 pawn and focus on his counterplay against white's d4. Since e5 is not possible anymore, uh, black's major weapon should be some like c7, c5. Uh, but we know there are some problems with this c7, c5. Uh, because, uh, well, in many cases, white may ignore it, white may play something like d4, d5, grabbing additional space. Uh, since c4 is not hanging right now, at least there are no problems with losing it, it's better for black to focus on controlling e4 and d5 squares. And here is the move knight to f6, which serves this goal. After that, d5 is controlled, and black is more or less ready to play c5 at some point. We may notice that e4 is also controlled, which means if white wants to continue with the development of the king's side, it's better to put the pawn on e3. Because preparing e4 will take some time and black has some options to control this e4 additionally. So normally white just plays this modest e3 move, uh, attacking c4 pawn, overprotecting d4, um, and just waiting for black's response, because everything depends on that. Um, black has different options here, but as I said, the main idea is to play c5. For that, we need to control d5 square better. So the main move here is something like e6, which may look like something uh, 
too passive. But it serves the main goal first of all, and black will have a chance to activate the bishop a bit later. It may look like a bit more logical would be just to put the bishop on g4 first uh, and to play e6 then, so that the bishop will be active and the pawn will be on e6. But the problem with that is that the bishop becomes a target rather quickly. After bishop takes c4, let's say e6, white may play this straightforward h3 move. Bishop is forced to somewhere to f5 or h5, doesn't really matter, then g4. Bishop is forced to g6. And after something like knight to c3, a6 may become a, a serious uh, problem for black because white continues with the simple knight to e5 move. And as you can see, bishop doesn't have squares anymore. So probably more accurate would be just to delay that g4, I mean to start with knight c3 and then to play g4 followed by knight e5 so that e4 square is already controlled. But you get the idea here. So white is getting the advantage of pair of bishops rather quickly and easily. Um, after some like knight d7, knight takes g6 and h takes g6. Uh, it may look like these pawns on h3 and g4 are vulnerable, uh, but it's not really a problem. Moreover, white has a nice way to protect everything. Uh, it is a bit surprising with bishop back to f1. Really nice one in my opinion. Uh, first of all, there is no reason to keep this bishop on that diagonal for so long time. Uh, on g2, it will be a much better place to exert some additional pressure on black's queen side and also protect the king side uh, in a very efficient way. For example, c6, bishop to g2, and everything is clear. So white has a better central situation, pair of bishops, some potential of playing on the queen side, uh, organizing the minority attack with b4, a4, b5, and also some central activity is still possible. Black is quite passive here. That's why developing the bishop at early stage is not so good. It's better to play e6 and then to try to develop the bishop on a8, h1 diagonal. So let's get back to that line. So black plays e6 here. White obviously captures the pawn on c4. And now it's time for black to make a decision. It's possible to play c5 immediately, of course. But another interesting way to do the same thing is to start with the a6. In my opinion, it may lead to similar positions and on practice it uh, usually does. Uh, so there is no big difference, I guess, in the move order here. I just think that a6 is a bit more flexible because uh, you may not want to play c5 at early stage. You may be uh, focusing on something like b5 instead, followed by bishop b7, just delaying c5 for some time. So a6 is a useful move, controlling b5 square, preparing b5, and white has a choice here. So um, there are different ways to react to a6. It's possible to play a4 preventing it, but in many cases it's not very dangerous. So that uh, castling, a simple and natural way to uh, continue white's play here, uh, should be just okay here. Um, so now black has a choice between playing c5 and b5. If black plays b5 immediately, white may want to put the bishop on d3. Uh, why? Well, because in this case, white will have some interesting options of uh, playing e4, e5 uh, in the nearest future. Moreover, b5 is a liability because white may always underline, under, undermine it uh, with the a2, a4 move. And uh, black will have some problems because playing something like b4 may weaken c4. Let's have a look at that. So bishop goes to b7, white just plays a4, undermining the pawn. Black doesn't want to play c6 to limit the bishop, so b4 looks very natural. Uh, it controls c3, prevents the knight to c3, but the knight has uh, another square to occupy, it is knight to d2, which is much more logical now because white is fighting for c4 square as well. So if black waits for several moves, it may be uh, even not possible to play c5, because another idea behind knight d2 is to put the knight here, controlling c5, exerting some pressure on a5, a bit later something like queen c2, and if black never plays c5, this c pawn becomes a weakness. So black wants to undermine the pawn d4 right now to get rid of the potential weakness. And that is exactly what I was talking about. White has an interesting option of uh, playing e4 here. Yes, sacrificing the pawn on d4 for some time, but grabbing the space. And after knight goes away somewhere, the knight gets to e4. And white will have some interesting options in the center and on the king side. Pay attention to the weakness of d6. Pay attention to vulnerability of the g5. And once the knight goes away from f6, there will be also a problem with the h7. So c5 looks a bit better. 
after uh, white's castling. So black undermines the pawn immediately here. And this is a critical position already because white has two different ways to deal with this c5. So the one is to allow black to take on d4 actually and to play the position with the isolated pawn. This is one of the most important pairings in Queen's Gambit accepted. Another way to uh, react to c5 is just to capture the pawn and simplify the position, which looks like uh, what black wants exactly, but the position is really tricky. So let's start with this simplification. D takes c5, uh, allowing black to take on d1 if he wants. Um, another option is actually to take on c5 here. Uh, all right, let's start with this one. So bishop takes c5, uh, kind of saying that, okay, you can take on d8, I take with the king, but then my king goes to e7 and I'm fine. In this case, uh, white may want to play queen to e2, saving queens on the board. So as you can see now, position has no pawns on c and d files. And this type of positions is one of the most uh, interesting ones because it's really tricky, although it looks very simple. Uh, so black has already committed uh, a weakening of the b6. Uh, it may be a problem a bit later. But the main problem right now is that white is going to play rook to d1 and queen has no good square. So it will be always kind of under attack, another rook is going to c1 and so forth. So uh, after queen e2, let's say knight goes to c6, uh, white continues with a3 preparing b4. This is very interesting now because black plays b5. At very first glance, black already has no problems. So after bishop to b7, white plays b4, black's bishop goes back to d6, and white's bishop goes to b2, black castles, knight goes to d2. So Everything looks just absolutely equal, but it's not because there is one tiny detail which makes white's position better here. Pay attention to the placement of the knight on c6 and white's knight on d2. While the knight on c6 is doing nothing, literally, so it's really limited all around, uh, white's knight is going to occupy c5 really soon. So the plan is simple for white. One rook goes to c1, another one goes to d1, and at some point there is a maneuver of knight b3 and c5, which is very annoying. So it is one of these positions which looks almost equal, but it's never equal. Black will have serious problems here, in my opinion. So another option for black is to exchange queens immediately after d takes c5. So let's get to that one. So in this position, black captures the queen. Rook takes on d1. And now it's time to take the pawn. So bishop captures on c5. So that is also a very interesting position. Again, it looks equal, but it's uh, not really equal, but has to be very careful because of the weakness on uh, b6. This bishop on c5 is also becoming a uh, target. So after white's bishop to e2 move, which looks very strange, but you will understand the idea a bit later. Uh, for example, black is castling, which is quite natural. Uh, now white plays knight to d2. And that was the idea behind bishop to e2. So knight is going to occupy c4. Not necessarily this knight, just one of white's knights, may go to c4 to exploit the weakness of b6 square. For instance, after rook d8, knight jumps to e5, another very interesting move, uh, limiting black's knight, because development of c on c6 is not good in case of exchange of on c6, there will be a weakness on the c file. And if black plays something like knight to d7 here, well, it may be really ugly after something like knight b3 or knight to c4, and there is a penal on the d file. So followed by bishop f3 exerting some pressure on b7, it may cause some problems to black. Um, so after knight to e5, it's possible to play a bishop to e7, just going away with the bishop again, avoiding uh, necessary uh, attacks and also protecting the rook, kind of preparing knight to d7. Uh, white responds with knight e5 to c4. And that is the problem. So b6 square is quite vulnerable. There is a direct threat of knight to b6 and it will be a constant weakness in black's camp. Once again, bishop f3 is coming, uh, so that it will be not so simple to develop the dark squid bishop, it will be kind of always pinned to this b7 pawn. So uh, although position looks uh, oversimplified, we have no pawns in the center anymore, and the pawn structure is almost completely symmetrical, well, this position is quite annoying for black. So this is one direction, just to exchange queens to simplify the things and to try to squeeze uh, the win from this position with just a little advantage for white. 
Another direction is to allow the appearance of the isolated pawn. So let's get to it. Since white decided not to take on c5, uh, he has to understand that black may not only take on d4, but also continue with the b5, grabbing some space on the queen side. There are different options for white here, different approaches. White may ignore it, uh, what may prevent it. So let's start with the most straightforward one, which is a4 move, just prevents in b5. So it definitely serves the main goal. So b5 is almost never possible after this, but it has a serious drawback behind. So it is weakening of the b4 square, uh, which black can use later on. So uh, in this case, black develops the knight on c6. Uh, white may continue with the knight to c3 move, uh, where after black captures on d4, White recaptures with the pawn. Here we get our main pattern, the isolated queen pawn. And now I think you can understand already what is the problem with the b4. So the main idea when you play against the isolated pawn is to blockade it first. So square d5 plays a great role here. And now uh, black will have a chance to use it with the help of maneuver knight to b4 and later on knight to d5. For example, bishop goes to e7 here. White develops the bishop to g5, castling. White plays rook to e1, very natural move, uh, placing the rook on the open file and also uh, preparing something like knight to e5 later on with some pressure on f7 and e6. And black may play knight to b4 right now. After, for example, queen to e2, also very natural move uh, because the other rook should occupy the d file supporting d4. Uh, it's the most optimal uh, placement of rooks in such a situation because if you plan the attack on the king side and that is what uh, white is going to do here uh, well one of the pieces should support the isolated pawn because after all it's a weakness and it may be a good idea to put an, one of the rooks there because minor pieces will be busy with the attack and the rook will support that pawn but not, not only that so it will be possible to use that rook in the attack with the help of the rook lift as well as placing like d4, d5 if that square is not controlled enough. For example, black may play knight f6 to d5 here. Uh, just trying to simplify the things a bit and already using this weakened squares d5 and b4. Uh, after bishop takes e7, knight takes e7, position remains quite complicated. Uh, for example, rook a to d1, knight goes to d5, uh, and white's knight goes to e5. Uh, but we may notice that it's rather solid. So first of all, black managed to exchange one pair of minor pieces, which is a good strategy uh, when you want to um, make opponent's attacking chances lower. And so uh, black also has very nice uh, pair of knights here protecting each other. It's possible to uh, prepare the development of the uh, light squared bishop, which is at the moment passive, but it's okay if black plays on like b6 and bishop to b7 later on. Although, as I said, this position remains complicated even without dark squared bishops, so white still has some attacking possibilities a bit later, rook d3 to rook h3, which is not possible right now because of knight f4. Uh, some maneuvers connected with, for example, relocating the bishop a bit, so it may occupy diagonal b1, h7, simply going through a2 to b1, uh, followed by, for example, so like queen e4 or maybe queen h5, it depends. So. Um, it's, it's an interesting uh, situation and requires some understanding of how to play uh, positions with or against the isolated queen pawn. Another approach is to ignore b7, b5. Uh, so let's have a look at that one. So instead of preventing b5 with the a4 move, it's also possible just to step back with the bishop for now. Uh, it's a nice move because, well, you're ready to move b5 with something else than just moving the bishop. So b5 comes without a tempo. For example, if black's b5 right now, white has, in addition to other moves, something like a4 undermining the pawn. And we know already uh, what's wrong with something like b4 here. So this weakens c4 square and white may use it, simply moving the knight there. From c4, the knight will control e5, d6, b6 and a5, in other words, quite a lot and it will uh, make black's position not so pleasant to play because, well, it will be really hard to regroup the pieces. So normally black doesn't uh, play b5 immediately here. 
uh, instead preferring something like knight to c6, again developing the piece, exerting some pressure on d4. And here white has, again, several options. Uh, it's possible to play knight to c3, continuing with the development. It's possible to play uh, queen to e2. It's more like, you know, gambit style, but it's not a real gambit because white is not really sacrificing the pawn on d4. So let's start with the knight to c3 anyway, because it looks so natural to develop the knight here. Black captures on d4, again, uh, forcing the appearance of the isolated pawn on d4. Continues with the development of the king side. White again puts the bishop on g5. Why it's so important? Because, well, the knight f6 is the main defender of h7. At the same time, it's the main defender of the d5 square. So sometimes white has some ideas connected with just taking that knight and then, uh, you know, making something like d4, d5 breakthrough or maybe directly attacking h7. Um, so black may continue with casting here. And white has very interesting idea how to amplify the attack right now. So it is, at first glance, not very interesting move queen to d2 because what the hell the queen is doing here. But the idea behind it is really nice. For example, uh, if uh, black plays knight to a5 now, which looks interesting, just attacking the bishop, maybe intending to occupy c4 if the bishop goes away. Um, in this case, uh, bishop just steps back to c2. Black continues in a very normal way, b5, controlling c4 square and intending to play something like bishop to b7 to control d5 additionally. And right here, queen from d2 goes to f4. That was the basic idea behind queen d2, so very interesting maneuver. Uh, guess where the queen goes? Well, actually to h4 to attack h7. And that's uh, where bishop g5 uh, plays really good role because Already here, black is more or less forced to make some sort of a weakening. Obviously, playing something like h6 may be very dangerous because white may simply capture there and bring in rooks and minor pieces to the king side, uh, finish the attack uh, in like five or six moves. So it's not recommended. But the threat to h7 is real and black has to react. Because if black is waiting for some moves, let's say bishop b7, white brings another piece to the game and say black just continues to play on the queen side with rook to c8 move. Well, white plays queen to h4, now creating a direct threat of taking the knight and taking on h7. Uh, black should respond with a g6. As I said before, h6 is too dangerous because of the possible sacrifice. So g6 here. And this is a weakening of dark squares, but not only around the king, literally everywhere here. And white has very nice idea, which is very typical and worth remembering. All of a sudden, all the d5 is controlled really good. At first glance, white plays d5. And after e takes d5, plays simple rook to e1 move. Creating an amazing threat of just taking on e7 and then taking on f6. And it becomes really ugly for black. For example, if rook jumps to c4, trying to get rid of the queen, which attacks the knight as well as the bishop on g5, white simply continues with knight to b4 move. And, well, although black is a pawn up, but it's not so clear how to deal with all these numerous weaknesses. And never forget, white always has different rook leaves, like rook e3 or rook d3, bringing the rook quickly to the king side, continuing the attack. There are different attacking possibilities, including something like knight f5 a bit later. But for now, black first has to solve the problem of uh, heading pieces on the king side. Uh, I'm not sure if it is uh, so simple. Probably it's not. Uh, obviously, black doesn't have to play all these moves, but I just wanted to show you one of the uh, typical ideas and one of the uh, most interesting possibilities to bring the queen to the king side quickly. So let's get back a bit and look at uh, white's other possibilities. All right, so the next one is uh, queen to e2, uh, which gives white a chance to be a bit more aggressive along the d-file already here. As I said before, it's not a real sacrifice because after c takes d4, white just plays rook to d1 and exploits the position of black's queen here. So black cannot really save the pawn here. Instead, uh, black should rather focus on the development. And after e takes d4, we get the same isolated queen pawn, black castles, White plays knight to c3. And here black has to be much more careful because since the rook is already on d1, uh, white may want to play something like d4, d5 
is nearest the next move. So black has to respond somehow, and there are two options. They are knight to a5, getting rid of the bishop on b3, trying to force it to c2, and another one, which looks pretty logical, is knight to b4, fighting for d5. Let's start with the knight to b4 move. Uh, in this case, since d4 is protected, white may put the knight on e5 immediately. Uh, another uh, reasoning for this move is that uh, knight went away from c6 and no longer controls e5. So this square is free to occupy. Why not bring the knight to so active position here? Uh, black continues with seemingly very logical knight to d5, locating the d4 for a long time. And here comes the idea behind rook to d1 move. So white may play rook to d3 immediately. Bring the rook to very active position, g3 or h3, dependent on the situation. And it's possible here because bishop controls f4. Never forget about this trick. So another option for black here, as I said before, is to play knight to a5. And this looks a bit better. In that case, uh, bishop steps back to c2 because white wants to save that bishop on the board. It's a very important attacking piece. And uh, black may continue with a b5 move here, fighting for c4 square. Uh, here white has different options. Uh, one of the drawbacks behind b5 is, for example, that c5 is uh, no longer protected with the pawn. And uh, white may want to use it with the help of knight to e4 move. Let's say bishop goes to b7. Knight jumps to c5, bishop gets to d5, look at this one, all right, it was on c8, limited with own pawns, but after right moves it appeared on very good position on d5, but white also has some advantages here, so look at this, two great knights, the one controls the situation on the queen side, another one exerts some pressure on uh, the king side, so position remains very complicated, black may play something like knight to c4, and it's hard to say who is playing for what. Most likely, uh, this position leaves us uh, the possibility of all three results. In addition to knight e4 option followed by knight c5, white may focus on his kingside play, just as usual. Bishop to g5, after moves bishop to b7, knight to e5, rook to c8, rook to c1, and knight to c4. We get this typical position with the isolated queen pawn. So it's really hard to say uh, who's better here. Most likely position is roughly balanced. Uh, black enjoys some nice squares on the queen side, like c4, d5 potentially, and potential play against uh, isolated pawn, because never forget its kind of weakness, especially if the pieces are being exchanged, it becomes more and more obvious. Uh, white, on the other hand, has very active setup on the king side and may think of attack there. Uh, it's possible to use the b1 h7 diagonal, some rook lifts, maybe bring the queen closer to the king, and so on. Uh, and this is typical for the whole queen's gambit accepted. Uh, usually, uh, you just get one of the typical positions, just this one with the isolated pawn, and the rest is no longer the theory of the queen's gambit accepted. The rest is just your ability to play this position right with black or white pieces, it doesn't matter. So if you start playing queen's gambit accepted with you know, both colors, I think it's the best way to learn, uh, you will learn a lot about positions with isolated pawns and you'll be ready to play these positions uh, in each and every opening uh, whenever it is just has a reason on the board. So it's strongly recommended. Uh, I wish you good luck. I think after this uh, videos, uh, you actually got the understanding of what uh, it is to play Queen's Gambit accepted for both colors. In the next video, we're going to switch to the Queen's Gambit declined. Thank you for your attention and see you next videos.